Well, howdy, Pastor Landon here, and it is time for Real Men. We wanted to welcome all you men to this channel. We are so thankful you're joining with us tonight. Um, something really cool that I wanna let you guys know about. We have churches all over the country that are tuning in with us right now, watching this service together, um, and we're thankful for all of them. We're thankful for churches that believe in men being equipped, because that's what we're all about. If you guys want more resources on manhood, feel free to text MEN to 99383, and we will shoot you over some awesome resources on how to be a better man, uh, maybe even in an exclusive talk. Uh, so guys, thank you again for joining us today. We put out this content for you guys. So this sermon is gonna be awesome. If you're a pastor across the country and you wanna come join us, a senior pastor that wants to come join us and check out Real Men, uh, we'd love to meet with you, have you come out, tour you around the church and show you the secret sauce that makes Real Men work. We've got 300 to 400 men gathering every single week here at Trinity Church and um, they meet around tables, they discuss, they pray for each other. It is absolutely epic and we hear tons of good Bible teaching from Pastor Mark. Uh, one of my favorite moments is 350 men gathered together, arms raised, worshiping Jesus. It is awesome, guys. Um, and if you just want to come visit with your men's group, come on out. We'd love to see you. Uh, real men, Scottsdale is in a terrible place to be in the winter. Um, it's only like 75 and sunny all the time. So guys, come on out. Uh, with that, it's sermon time. Get ready. night of the week, best guys in the world, Pastor Mark Driscoll, pre-recording because it's spring break week and I want to get a little time with Grace and our son Gideon, uh, but did not want to miss the opportunity to continue in our series on Elijah. If you're new, we're looking at the life of Elijah and you can study it for yourself. Start in 1 Kings, let's say chapter 16, go through 2 Kings chapter two and just read it for yourself. You can get the study guide on your way out if you're here at Trinity Church, if you're watching online, realfaith.com, you can get a free digital copy or for a gift of any amount, we'll send you the study guide. But we're spending four months looking at the story of Elijah. And of course, it's God who's over the entire story, a God working through the man of God, Elijah the prophet, and he is against Ahab and Jezebel, a king and a queen that are not just people, but people that are empowered by demonic and evil forces. And though Ahab and Jezebel no longer live today, the demons who work through them continue their work in our day. That's our working thesis. And we've examined this relationship a bit of Ahab and Jezebel. And today I wanna to focus on Ahab. Next week, we're gonna focus on the Jezebel spirit. And then uh, in point four, the fourth week of this series of real men, we'll look at how to deal with and overcome those demonic forces of Ahab and Jezebel. But today we're gonna to look at 28 signs of the Ahab spirit. And I'm gonna hit these issues rather quickly because I've got about 28 points in 35 minutes. But let me start by discussing seven things that Ahab's love, uh, this was Ahab in the Old Testament and those who are oppressed or possessed by the Ahab spirit. And I believe that uh, the Bible's clear that a spirit can work through a man or a woman, but in my experience, it is oftentimes men who have the Ahab spirit, Jezebel who have, uh, is the spirit that oftentimes women have. The Jezebel spirit is marked by control. It's all about Control, being in control, not being healthy, not being right, not being godly, being in charge, being in control. A man or a woman can have that demonic spirit. In addition, Ahab is primarily marked by passivity. This is where they have a codependent relationship. The passivity of the Ahab spirit allows the control of the Jezebel spirit. And so when it comes to Ahab, 
if you were going to give one word, it would be passive. Or to use another word that Jesus uses in Revelation 2 to rebuke the Jezebel spirit at work in the church at Thyatira, it's tolerance. Tolerance is another word for passive. And the word uh, passive comes from the old French passif, which means suffering or undergoing hardship. The word passive uh, in our language also derives from the Latin passivus, which means capable of feeling or suffering and pate, which means to suffer. Here's what happens. Those who operate with an Ahab tendency or spirit, they allow permit suffering. And theirs is not so much sin of commission where they're causing the evil and harm, it's omission where they're not stopping harm and evil. If a man has the Ahab spirit or an Ahab tendency, they oftentimes avoid difficulty, they don't like conflict, they don't like responsibility, they're passive. They allow evil to be done to their wives. They allow evil to be done to their children or grandchildren. These men are often liked and loved, but never respected. People have compassion for them, but they don't follow them because these are not leaders. They're weak men, they're passive men. They're sometimes cowards and indifferent. If you are a passive man, you are tolerating the Jezebel in your life, and you are allowing harm to come to your wife and to your children. That being said, here are seven things that Ahab's love. Number one, fear. They are guided by fear. Um, faith is when you trust that God is going to show up. Fear is when you trust that Satan is going to show up. The difference between faith and fear is who you are expecting to act. The Ahab spirit is constantly hiding. He is constantly afraid. In the story of Ahab, uh, he has a spirit of fear. He has fear of man. He avoids conflict, has very short range thinking, and also is often hiding in the castle. If you are driven by fear, you will end up being an Ahab. Number two, the Ahab spirit uh, loves entitlement. Ahab was spoiled his entire life. He grew up in a wealthy family. He received the kingship. He didn't need to fight a war to win it. He didn't need to win an election to secure it. He just received it. He has this sense of entitlement. He's a very soft man. He's a very spoiled man. He's a very self-indulgent man. In addition, anytime he wanted something, he just assumed and presumed that he should have it. This is like a man who can't stop eating or drinking or stealing or gambling because at the end of the day, he's just very self-consumed. And we'll deal with that in a moment. But there's even an occasion where uh, Ahab sees a piece of land belonging to a man named Naboth and decides, I want that piece of land. He doesn't have any right to it and he doesn't frankly need it, but he wants it. So ultimately he steals it. It's that sense of entitlement. In addition, victimhood. Ahab always and only sees himself as the victim, never the villain. When he has a confrontation with Elijah, what he says is, you are the troubler of Israel. What he's saying is, you are the problem. I am the victim. Everything that is hard in my life is not my fault or responsibility. He blame shifts toward Elijah. And I would submit to you these three things, governed by a spirit of fear, a lazy self-indulgent entitlement, and a sense of victimhood, that would encounter an entire generation that we're now dealing with of incredibly soft, weak, woke young men. And if you are one of those men, you need to repent and stop being an Ahab and start being an Elijah. In addition, Ahabs love coddling. They love to be over-mothered and under-fathered. They love their wives to take care of them as if they were children. What we see throughout the storyline of this codependent enabling demonic relationship between Ahab and Jezebel is that he acts more like a son and she acts more like a controlling and domineering mother. There are times, for example, where he uh, is in bed facing the wall, moping and throwing a fit because he didn't get the piece of land from Naboth that he wanted. She comes and consoles him, she flatters him. You're such a strong, tough guy, which is nothing but flattery, it's not true. He's actually a very weak and passive man. She rubs his back and she tells him, there, there, I'll go uh, murder Naboth and get the land for you. He likes being coddled. And this is a, this is a seductive trick 
of these sort of satanic men. They're passive and emotional and indifferent and soft and whiny and cowardly and then waiting for someone else to take care of them. Because what some passive men have learned, if you're passive long enough, an aggressive woman will show up and she will care for you like a mother. That's how many men get into very unhealthy, dysfunctional dating and sexual relationships that are doomed for destruction and not for marriage. Number five, an Ahab spirit loves emotionalism. They've learned to use emotion to manipulate others. There are times in the storyline um, that he uh, is yelling. There are times that he is crying. He's a very emotional personality, but not in a healthy way. And if you have an Ahab tendency, you're very emotional or you're strategically emotional. If you think you can get your way, you'll raise your voice. If you think you can get your way, you will sulk and whine like a victim and a baby. You will talk about all of your suffering and how, life your, how hard your life has been. And you're entirely selfish and you're not others focused. And so what happens is Ahab is the king of Israel. He commands an army, he rules a nation. He also is prone to lay in the fetal position, throw a fit like a toddler and sulk waiting for Jezebel to come and comfort him. In addition, Ahab's love flattery. They're insecure and that contributes to their passivity. They know that they are not great men. They know in their heart of hearts that they are not strong men. They know in their mind of minds that they are not impressive men. And that leaves them open to women who will use flattery or men as well. And by flattering an insecure Ahab, you can control them because they live for the approval of others. That's part of their insecurity. Flattery is something that is evil according to the book of Proverbs. And what flatterers do, they will compliment you, hear me in this, to control you. The point of flattery is to ultimately control you. And so for example, we see when he is, uh, King Ahab is in bed, throwing a fit, whining like a toddler. Jezebel, his wife said to him, quote, thou art of great authority and thou governest well. What she's saying is, oh, there, there, you're a great man. You're a strong man. You're an amazing man. You're a wonderful man. You could just see this pathetic, weak imp of an imitation of a human being looking at the, uh, do you really think I'm special? Oh, I do. Do you think I'm smart? You are smart. I'm not that tough. No, you're tough. It's just flattery. Men who are Ahabs are easily controlled by fear of man, manipulation, and flattery. Number seven, Ahab's love, perversion. Ahab's relationship with Jezebel was emotionally unhealthy. It was spiritually demonic. It was political suicide, but it was sexually awesome. He was willing to forsake every aspect of relationship with a woman, the mental, the emotional, the spiritual, the relational, to just enjoy the sexual. There was nothing about this woman that was enjoyable except for the sexual relationship. That's why when Jesus rebukes the church at Thyatira in Revelation 2, he says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel who claims to be a prophetess and is not and is teaching my people and seducing my people to porneia, to sexual sin. The one thing the Jezebel spirit can do is manipulate the Ahab spirit through seduction, flirtation, sensuality, sexuality, and pleasure. Anytime you are being controlled by your desires and your lusts, you just know that you are an Ahab being controlled by a Jezebel spirit. And for you single men, hear me in this, and let me put the father hat on. If you meet a gal and she's just really good in bed, so you sort of overlook everything else, that is not your wife, that is your witch. And you gotta be very careful that you don't sign up for a lifetime supply of sex because with it comes a lifetime supply of demons. And if that woman controls you through sleeping with you, two things you need to know. Number one, she'll never stop trying to control you. And number two, she'll probably start sleeping with someone else. If she's learned to manipulate you through sexual perversion and pleasure, that means that she isn't in love with you, that she is using you and she knows how to use men. In addition, uh, 21 things that Ahabs avoid. Number one, they avoid headship. 
The Bible says that God made the men to be the heads. The question is not, are you the head of your household? The question is, are you a good head or a bad head? Ahab is supposed to be the head of his family and their nation. He is the head of neither. Now he will pretend to be the head, but ultimately Jezebel is the neck. She controls him in every way. What happens is if you have an Ahab spirit, you don't exercise the dominion and authority that God has given to you. So at home, you're passive. You let your wife take charge or maybe one of your emotional or controlling children or maybe your extended family or your in-laws that act like outlaws. You let somebody else dominate, rule your home. Maybe even your wife's friends. In addition, at church, an Ahab allows others to say and do what they want. They don't have the conflict. There's no fight in them. There's no fight in them. And if they have responsibility at work, sometimes an Ahab at work is, is very passive and permissive. The result is wherever they have responsibility, they abdicate it. They avoid it and then someone else assumes it and rules. In addition, Ahab's avoid conflict. They do not like, you, they don't like being corrected or rebuked. They don't like hard conversations. They don't like being told no. They don't like things being made public that are true. There's no record in Ahab's life of him ever having healthy conflict, zero in the entire storyline. In addition, his wife is demonic, evil. She falsifies government documents. She murders someone, she steals a piece of land, she closes all the churches, she murders the prophets, she closes the Bible teaching schools, she opposes the man of God, and he never says anything. He is not going to cross her because he knows if you engage, you will enrage. That this woman is like a grenade with a pin pulled and the last thing you wanna do is bump into her, so keep your safe distance. He doesn't do conflict. And he really hates Elijah and those with the Ahab spirit hate those with the Elijah spirit because Elijah is willing to confront him to his face. You're in sin, you're wrong, you need to repent. God's gonna judge you. Your wife is evil, you're horrible, you're terrible father. I mean, all these things are true, they're all true. And that's why he hates Elijah. Now, Elijah speaks the truth on behalf of God. In the story, as you study, you need to ask this, am I more like Jezebel? Controlling, domineering, overbearing, maybe even perverted. Am I more like Ahab? Passive, indifferent, tolerating, the nicest guy you ever met that no one follows or respects? Or am I like Elijah? Willing to say what needs to be said and do what needs to be done, not to be in control, but because if you don't get in the way of evil, evil never stops itself. If you don't say the truth, the truth will never be stated. If you don't fight for what's right, wrong will always win. If you don't get in the middle, then the bad guys hurt women and children. He hates conflict. Number three, uh, the, the Ahabs, they hate overt living. There are, there are people that are covert and overt. Those that are overt, they're honest. Like, when you look in the story, Elijah is very overt. My name's Elijah, I'm a prophet, I speak on behalf of God, you need to repent. You know, here's what's happening, very overt. Ahab, very covert. Sneaky, controlling, manipulative, working behind the scenes, sending other people out to have the hard conversations and make the hard decisions and have the conflicts. He's very overt, excuse me, he's very covert. And what happens is um, he's never really exposed until he's confronted by Elijah. In a way, the Ahabs are like Judas Iscariot. Now, Jesus had the Elijah spirit, the spirit of God. That's why even when Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? They said, well, some people think you're Elijah because he has the Holy Spirit like Elijah. And Jesus also had an Ahab. His name was Judas Iscariot. He was passive, he was quiet, he was out of the central feature of the scenes. He's sort of off in the shadows, doesn't say or do a lot. 
until the moment comes. And then suddenly you realize that he's been completely covert. For the entire three years he's with Jesus, he's been stealing money from him and plotting against him. And he's very passive. He doesn't fight with Jesus. He lets the Roman government and the religious leaders arrest Jesus and murder Jesus. He doesn't get his hands dirty. Then he, he can stand off and just say, well, I, I didn't do anything. I didn't, that wasn't me. He's very covert. Beware of those who are covert. Sometimes you don't know who someone is until it's too late. If we would have been reading the story of Jesus' life and asked, okay, someone's gonna betray Jesus. Who's it gonna be? My guess is we would have voted for Peter. He has this spiritual gift of putting his foot in his mouth and always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. He even rebukes Jesus. But here's why there's hope for Judas. He's overt, or excuse me, say it again. There's no hope for Judas because he's covert. There is hope for Peter because he's overt. With Peter, you're like, dude, you're a mess, but at least we know who you are. So we can work on that. With Judas, like we don't even know who you are. And that's because who you are is horrifying and terrifying and it won't be revealed until the fatal moment of attack. In addition, Ahab's avoid leading at home. Sometimes Ahab's will lead at work. They don't lead at church. And an, an Ahab most likely, if they're going to abdicate their leadership, it's gonna be at home. It's gonna be at home. They don't come home. They don't enforce healthy rules to create family culture. They don't tell their wife no. They don't disagree. They don't draw healthy boundaries with the extended family. And here's what happens. If you're not a healthy person, you will allow the least healthy people to decide what your family looks like. The least healthy family will invite themselves on your vacation, on your holiday, into your budget, on your schedule, call, text, and email, impose and make demands. The point is this, somebody's gonna set the culture for your home. And you as husband and father have been ordained and appointed of God to lead at home and to set that culture. And if you don't, the same thing will happen as Genesis 3, where Adam acted like Ahab and he was passive. Eve acted like Jezebel, became controlling and Satan stepped up, not only making himself the head of their family, but the human family. That's why Jesus has to come to forgive sin and to disarm the demonic and to create himself as a new head over the family of believers. In addition, Ahab's avoid learning. Now they don't avoid hearing, but they avoid learning. The difference between hearing and learning is applying and obeying. What's amazing about Ahab, he is in the presence repeatedly of Elijah the prophet. Just think about this. There's a day uh, many years later when Jesus is on a mount and Moses and Elijah come down from heaven. And uh, you know Peter's one of the disciples, he's there, he's like, this is the best day of my whole life. Let's just build tents and let's just camp and hang out forever. Peter's like, I'm not even going home to my wife. Like, I just wanna hang out with Moses and Elijah. Here is Ahab in the presence of Elijah, one of the greatest men in the history of the world, a man at the end of his life, God sends a chariot to take him straight into heaven. He doesn't even die. What does Ahab learn from Elijah? Nothing. He never asks a question. He never takes a note. He never obeys or heeds anything. If you're an Ahab, you may be in a great church and it's a great place to hide because people think if you're hearing, you're learning. You're not learning unless you take what you're hearing and you apply it with heeding and obeying. In addition, they uh, avoid healthy spirituality. Ahab and Jezebel are very spiritual people. We'll get to Jezebel next week. But for Ahab, uh, he builds, he and his wife, she uses his money. They tear down all the Bible teaching schools and churches, if we can use that language. And instead they build these spiritual places dedicated to the demon God, Baal and the demonic goddess Asherah. So they're very spiritual. 
They have holidays, they open churches, they're very philanthropic, they're very spiritual, they're into witchcraft and they're into the signs. They're very spiritual, but they don't have healthy spirituality. They practice witchcraft, divination, they fund demonic cult ministry. And let me say this, Ahab and Jezebel love going to church. They're always going to, they open churches, they found churches. Just because someone is spiritual doesn't mean they're spirit filled. John tells us, test the spirits. Not every spirit comes from God. And so within Ahab, they can be very spiritual, but they're not spirit filled. In addition, they don't lead at work. Well, you see with Ahab at work, Jezebel makes all the decisions. Here's gonna be our religion. Here's gonna be our real estate portfolio. Here's gonna be our you know, employees. She makes all the decisions. She rules and reigns. If you are an Ahab at work, you are maybe even going to occupy a position where they call you president or CEO or CFO or manager, but you're just a puppet. And behind the scenes is someone with a Jezebel spirit just working you like a marionette and you're a puppet doing their bidding. In addition, uh, Ahab's avoid picking a church. I'll talk about this when we get into the Jezebel spirit next week. God had a spiritual commitment to his people that they were supposed to worship him alone. These are the Jewish people in the nation of Israel. They're supposed to heed and obey the Old Testament, the 10 commandments. What happens is Ahab marries Jezebel and she picks the church. So now we're gonna close all the real churches. We're gonna open our version of church. And let me say this, if you're an Ahab, you let your wife make all the spiritual decisions in the church and in the home and in your life. Some of you, if you're an Ahab, you know, you're just like, hey, honey, where do you wanna go to church? Now let me say this, you should consider your wife. The Bible talks about that, but you shouldn't follow your wife. You should make your decisions together and follow the Lord. But what happens when there's an Ahab, he's like, well, I'm not gonna pick our religion. I'm not gonna pick our church. I'm gonna pick our kids' school or their education. So let me say this, gentlemen, if your wife doesn't attend church with you and you're both believers, you may be an Ahab and she may be a Jezebel. If you are a man who has a propensity to go to whatever church she chooses, even if you don't like it, you don't feel right about it, doesn't work, doesn't fit, doesn't build up men to bless women and children, but you tolerate it and you go there, you may be an Ahab married to a Jezebel. In addition, uh, Ahab's avoid joy. You're gonna see in his life, he's a very emotional person, but he's not a very joyful person. You're gonna see him throwing a fit. You're gonna see him scared and hiding. You're gonna see him weeping. You're gonna see him yelling, but you'll never see him worshiping and filled with joy. Ahabs tend to be emotional people, but oftentimes not very joyful people. He hides a lot. He whines a lot. He sulks a lot. He weeps a lot. He doesn't rejoice a lot. In addition, Ahabs avoid difficult decisions. You'll see in the storyline of Ahab, every time there's a tough decision, he defers. Well, what do you think? What do you want? Or he just gets frozen and paralyzed. He doesn't say anything and he knows eventually his wife will do all the talking. It's okay to be a quiet guy, but not a silent guy. Even a quiet guy at some point has got to find his voice and he's got to lead and he's got to speak and he's got to make decisions. What happens over and over in the storyline of Ahab and Jezebel, every time there's a difficult decision, she makes it. Well, what kind of church are we gonna open? Honey, what kind of church do you wanna have? Well, are, are we gonna show up to Mount Carmel and send the false prophets? Well, honey, what do you think? Well, are we gonna let Naboth say no to the land deal or are we gonna kill him and steal it? Well, honey, you make the decision. Over and over and over, she makes all the, and here's why Ahabs do this. If it goes well, they benefit. If it goes poorly, they can blame somebody else. It's, a, it's again, it's passivity, it's indifference, it's, it's tolerance. If I make a decision, now I'm responsible for the decision. If I'm gonna call the shots, I gotta take the shots. If I don't make any decisions, then if it goes bad, someone else gets the blame, not me. That's the passive Ahab tendency. In addition, Ahabs avoid sacrifice. They're not courageous. They do things that are very selfish, not selfless. There's an occasion in the story of Ahab where uh, two kings and kingdoms go off to war. The other king 
he dresses up like a king, sets himself up on the hill, and he says, men, go to war. And he basically has got the flag flying over his head telling the enemies, come get me, I'm ready for the fight. Ahab doesn't do that. He does the exact opposite. He dresses up, not like the king. He's trying to blend in and hide and not be found. And he doesn't wanna be known. He's not willing to get in the middle for the well-being of his people. He will not sacrifice himself or make any sacrifices. And when it comes to the fight, he's gonna flee and hide rather than fight with courage. In addition, uh, what you don't see is generosity. Ahabs tend to avoid generosity. It's amazing to me that sometimes even in the church, men who uh, have domineering, overbearing, religious controlling wives who quote verses because they weaponize the Bible for control. Talk about that with Jezebel. Some women use the Bible because it's another way to control. The Lord told me, I prayed about it, blah, 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 false prophecy, false teaching, false prophetess. And so what happens in those occasions is if it's very interesting because very rarely are those people generous, families and marriages in my almost 30 years of ministry experience. And that is because the man is passive and the woman controls the finances. She makes all, the, we're gonna give or not give and she's, she's controlling the finances. What you don't see with Ahab, you don't see him be generous. He doesn't give to anyone or anything. He's not generous at all. He's very self-indulgent and very selfish. Even when it comes to Naboth's field, uh, he wants the guy's land, so how does he get it? He has his wife murder him and then he takes it. Doesn't even have generosity for stealing the inheritance and the legacy of the family. In addition, uh, Ahab's avoid correction. They don't like to be rebuked. If the church starts saying something that they're gonna have to change, they're never gonna show up again. If one guy says, hey, I need to talk to you about this. Like, oh, you hurt my feelings. I can't believe you. All of a sudden it becomes a victim and emotional. The question is not, is this true or false? The question is, am I going to activate or be passive? They don't like correction and confrontation. And you don't have to be a jerk about it, but you do need to be an Elijah about it. So Elijah's the one guy keeps getting in front of Ahab, putting his finger in the chest saying, you know what? God has a problem with you. It's not just between you and me, it's between you and him. Zero times, zero times, zero times does Ahab say, I'm sorry, that was wrong. It was my fault. I apologize, zero times. If you correct or confront an Ahab, they may cry, but they won't change. In addition, Ahab's hate caring. The only time we see him being emotional is when he's suffering or perceives that he is suffering. Isn't that, it feel bad about it? He's like, I can murder people, kill the prophets, shut down the church, defy God. The only time he gets emotional is when he doesn't get what he wants. He doesn't care about people. Very selfish, that's why he's passive. The only time that an Ahab really is motivated to be active is when it benefits them. Until there's something in it for them, there's nothing done by them. In addition, they avoid um, dirty work. Anytime there's kind of some dirty work to do, Jezebel will do it. Close the churches, okay, kill the prophets, okay. Have the battle with the 850 false prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth versus the one true prophet of Elijah. Okay, honey, take care of that. Go murder Naboth and steal the field, take care of that. What an Ahab does is they're just like, well, you take care of that. Well, can you do that? They'll delegate responsibility to their kids. They'll dump responsibility on their wife. Or they'll just sit there like timid, passive little boys until somebody steps up and does the hard chores. In addition, they hate family. If you are a passive man, you are allowing harm and evil to come to your wife and kids. If you read the storyline of 1 Kings 16, it's Naboth's family for generations. And it just says, and they were evil, and the next generation was more evil, and the next generation was more evil, and the next generation was more evil. And then Elijah comes and he says, unless all this changes, unless you lead your family, unless you worship God, unless you put an end to sin, I'm going to, I'm going to see God destroy your family and kill your son. 
And do you know what he does? Nothing. I mean, you would think if your family had been broken and damaged for generations and God was saying, I got a bounty on your son's head, you better, you better go make some changes and, and have him lead some changes. Like, no, I don't, I don't do that. That would be, that'd be a lot of conflict with my wife and maybe conflict with my son. And that seems like a lot of work and a lot of responsibility. And so what happens is generations of his family are cursed and God kills his wife and God kills his son. You know, there's no freaking fight in a man when he won't even get in the fight to protect his own children. That's an Ahab. In addition, Ahab's, they hate doing hard things. He's a soft guy. He's, he's raised as a prince. He's just, I mean, we, let's just say hypothetically, there was a soft beta male, redheaded prince with a witch of a wife who was high control, but seductive and good in bed. And he kept going in for trauma counseling because everything in his life, he sensed to be abuse that happened to him while he was eating you know, caviar in a, in a castle. Let's just hypothetically say there was a guy like that. That's Ahab. He's a guy who doesn't do hard things. His whole life has been soft. He doesn't do hard things. He's a very soft man. And this is why if you're fathering sons, you need to allow them to grow in strength and resilience because character is born through adversity. And so at the end of the day, if all you've ever done is seen your son overmothered and underfathered, they're going to be very soft. And then it reaches the point when full adult male responsibilities come on them, they crush them because they've not been working out their whole life. They don't have the strength. That's why we have a whole, and I love you young guys. And this is me putting the dad hat on and saying it's not too late, but just look around. What a freaking soft generation. Physically soft, mentally soft, spiritually soft, relationally soft, responsibly soft, financially soft, soft. And so as a man, it's like working out at the gym. You just keep pushing and getting stronger and the resistance builds strength. He's a very soft man. He doesn't do hard things. He just doesn't do hard. Anytime there's something hard, he's out. Or he stops and he quits. The last few, Ahab's, um, they, they hate rejection. They're insecure. They're codependent. The only reason he puts up with his wife, he's too insecure to be independent. Now she's independent, but he's dependent. He's very insecure. He's easily manipulated, controlled, run over. Even when she falsifies documents, steals land and murders Naboth, she doesn't even ask him because she knows he doesn't have an opinion. He's like, he's like a jellyfish. The dude's got no spine whatsoever. But he hates rejection. That's why he'll tolerate and put up with unhealthy people in relationships because he he'd rather be in an abusive relationship than alone. In addition, they reject hard comfort, uh, discomfort rather. Again, generations of kingly luxury. This guy loves pleasure and comfort. He sleeps in a soft bed. He has a staff. He has a harem. He's got a chef. He's got a chariot. He's got a vacation home. He's got another vacation home. He's got another harem. I mean, his whole life is nothing but comfort. And anything that looks uncomfortable or discomforting, he's out. This is why there's a whole younger generation of men who won't leave their mother's house even though they're in their 20s and 30s. It's comfortable here. She pays the bills, she pays for the internet, you know, mom takes care of me. And, and the point is this, at some point you've gotta stop nursing and it should be before 30. Otherwise, you're gonna end up like Ahab, just soft and dependent for the rest of your life. The last two, these men avoid initiative. They're passive, not active. They're reactive. They wait to see what other people say and do, but they don't initiate. And what we see here is throughout his life, his father made all the decisions until he got married. And maybe it was his father and his mother, and then his wife made all the decisions. So then God has to come in and destroy him 
and make some different decisions. The point is this, if you don't take initiative, you're passive and not active. God made men to be active, not passive, to be forward, not backward, to advance, not to retreat. And what happens with an Ahab, they just avoid initiative at all costs. And then lastly, they avoid reality. Ahab in his mind thinks, I'm a great guy. Uh, I'm rich, I'm successful, I'm the king of Israel, I have a hot wife, I got a family. I, I, I really have, I am pretty incredible. I mean, what I, have put, what I have put together, I mean, just look, I'm a king, I have a kingdom. I, I have a hot wife who's a Victoria's Secret model and, and all my kids are getting ready to have crowns on their heads and be royalty. My name's Ahab. And it's a denial of reality. It's a denial of reality. He doesn't deal with reality. Like, no, your wife's a demon possessed witch. Your sons are twice the sons of hell that you are. And uh, God has sent a prophet uh, to uh, renounce you. And ultimately you're gonna die and uh, your wife is gonna get dressed up like a prostitute and then get murdered and the dogs are gonna lick up her blood and then we're gonna kill your son. Like that's not a win. But if you ask these guys, they're like, oh, we're doing great, praise the Lord. It's such a good season. It's all this sort of denial of reality. Like, no, you're not doing good. Your wife, not doing good. Kids, not doing good. Future, not looking good. Oh, don't be so negative. Just have a good outlook, have a positive attitude. You just. It's, we're doing great. You're not dealing with reality. Until you get to reality, you can't change reality. If you never get to reality, reality never changes. What happens is if you are an Ahab, you're passive, that opens the door to a Jezebel who is controlling. In the story, Elijah is the type of Jesus. He's not passive and he's not controlling, he's assertive. Elijah is assertive. Jesus comes and he's assertive. Jesus isn't passive and he's not controlling, he's assertive. And so as you, as you read the story, are you more like Jezebel or are you more like Ahab? And how do you get to be more like Elijah filled with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Elijah, and more like Jesus who is the greater Elijah? And an assertive personality is not passive. They know when it's time to be active and time to wait patiently. They have discernment. An assertive personality is not controlling. They know when it's time to lead and they know when it's time to follow. And an assertive personality is able to not always be Ahab, not always be Jezebel, but seek to be like Jesus. So these will be the discussion and prayer questions. And I'm sure this will be awkward. Maybe this is why I didn't show up for this lecture. Now you're gonna to have to talk about it. Here's the, uh, here's the dangerous questions. Number one, what were your mom and dad like? Was your mom passive like Ahab, controlling like Jezebel or assertive like Elijah? How about your dad? Was your dad passive like Ahab, controlling like Jezebel or assertive like Elijah? Number two, what are you and if you're married, your spouse like? Are you like Ahab? Are you like Jezebel? Are you like Elijah? Your fiance, your girlfriend, your wife, or is she more like Ahab, passive, Jezebel, controlling, or Elijah, assertive? What changes do you need to make uh, in your life, in your family? And then the third one is just how can we pray for you? And let me say this, men, we all start somewhere. I've never met a man who started as Elijah, never met the other than Jesus, one guy. Everybody starts Ahab or Jezebel. We all have these tendencies and proclivities. As a result, we find ourselves in relationships with people like us so that they can affirm us and then people unlike us so they benefit us. And the goal is to ask, how can I be filled with the spirit of God, the spirit of Elijah, the spirit of Jesus to be an assertive person without being a passive or controlling person? And so let's just be honest, we all start slipping and sliding to one side or the other. And what we're asking is, Lord Jesus, how do we find a healthy, sane center and middle? And how do we have the spirit of God and have an assertive personality like Elijah and Jesus? And I wanna thank you, men, for giving me the honor of teaching. And my hope and prayer and goal is that together we get there. So around the table, the Ahabs are gonna tell the Jezebels what it's like to have a Jezebel in your life. 
the Jezebels are gonna tell the Ahabs what it's like to have Ahabs in your life. And the goal is that we all get to Elijah. Lord Jesus, please send the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Elijah, the spirit of Elisha, the spirit of John the baptizer, the spirit of Jesus Christ, all assertive men. Lord, in our world, there are some Jezebelian men, they're high control. But God, there's primarily, I think perhaps, a predominant spirit in our age of, of Ahab's, passive men, tolerant men, soft men, indifferent men, quiet men, men who watch life happen and don't make life happen. And I pray against the enemy of servants, their works and effects. I pray that this would be as is appropriate conviction and not condemnation. God, I confess publicly for me, if I don't watch it, I could be controlling. I'm certainly not passive. And Lord, I wanna be like Jesus who was assertive. And, and God, I pray for these men that you would give us all the Holy Spirit to become more like Elijah and Jesus, assertive and healthy and helpful in Jesus' name, amen.